typical precursor of a bubble breaking. If you're looking for the very early warning signs of a bubble breaking, you find the stocks that have done the best, uh, SPACs and, and particular SPACs and Tesla and, and, and uh, Bitcoin. And, and you wait until they start to have these big daily drops and then they recover and they drop and they recover. Uh, and, and, and that's the very early warning. And the market in 2000, for example, didn't go together. Uh, they took out the pet dot coms and shot them. The rest of the market continued to go up. It, it didn't even deign to notice the shooting of those little guys. They were only worth scores of millions or a couple of hundred million. Then they took out the junior growth stocks and shot them and the market kept going up. And then they took the medium growth stocks and shot them. And, and finally, by the summer, they were shooting the Cisco's and the, the entire tech uh, part of the market had been shot. And that had been 30% at the market peak of the total market cap. And yet the S&P by September was at the co-equal high of March, which meant that the other 70 had continued to rise. So that is a typical way. Bubbles don't necessarily break en masse, but having, having sliced off the tech and, and, and the dot coms, uh, the, and then finally the 70%, like a giant ice, iceberg, rolled over en masse the 70% and went down for two and a half years uh, uh, by 50%. Then finally, the 70%, like a giant ice, iceberg, rolled over en masse the 70% and went down for two and a half years. All right. Today is Tuesday. What is it? November 16th. Do we even care? Of course not. But anyhow, I got a good one for you tonight. And let's not waste any more time. In focus tonight, let's talk about the new warning from legendary investor Jeremy Grantham. And then we will go over macro data, specifically from retail sales. And lastly, what about some earnings reviews? And we start with Jeremy Grantham, legendary investor, of course. And the old man is at it again with the FUD. What's up with the FUD, bro? Market crash, market goes down, the bubble, what's going on here? Meanwhile, the market continues to go higher and higher and higher. So what does he know anyways? We, we the Robin idiots, we know what's up. The only problem is that Jeremy Grantham is old enough to have lived throughout pretty much every single bubble in modern history. So perhaps we should listen to him a little bit at least. And in this interview, the latest interview with Bloomberg, Jeremy Grantham warns about a lot of things. Legendary investor Grantham warns Tesla stock is in a bubble, duh, rings the inflation alarm and predicts an epic market crash. What is he talking about? Let's start with Grantham's take 
on Tesla. Let's talk about bubbles, but let's come in if we can through Tesla, because you've talked some about Tesla in the past. I mean, last time I checked, I think the market cap is something like 40 times what it was four years ago. Uh, is Tesla a bubble? Yes, that's pretty easy. I, and having said that, I'm the proud owner of a Model 3, and I, I do think they're magnificent vehicles, and I think Tesla has done extraordinarily well. But if you go back into the life cycle of the fangs, a Tesla is many multiples of the price to sales ratio that they were at this stage in their lives. And they have been brilliantly successful. So Tesla is A, assuming it will be brilliantly successful, and B, assuming it will be, in addition to that, multiples as successful as the other fangs. And they are some of the great companies in the history of capitalism. So, so this is a, a big ask. It is not just a big ask. It is pretty much impossible for the company to live up to the current valuations. I presented to you last night the comparison between Tesla, Toyota, VW, and other automotive manufacturers. And the valuations of Tesla out of whack don't make sense at all. Tesla is valued more than the entire automotive industry combined. Meanwhile, the revenues Tesla produce are a fraction of what these companies, the traditional automakers, produce. And I know what you're going to say, but what about the future, bro? Tesla has the robo-taxis, uh, the self-driving, the batteries. What about the seat belts, bro? What about the leather seats? Have you seen these leather seats? They're beautiful. They're worth at least 200 billion alone. Yeah, that's not going to cut it. It's impossible. Even with robo-taxis, which, by the way, it's a fraud for now, at least. We were promised robo-taxis by the end of 2019. Where are the robo-taxis, bro? But anyhow, even if Tesla produces robo-taxis, solar, Mars, condoms, it doesn't matter. It is impossible for the company to live up to the expectations of this valuation. Impossible. With one exception. If the company becomes a monopoly meaning no other car producer in the world. They all disappear, poof, gone. And the only sole player in the arena is Tesla. Will that happen? Of course not. And here's Grantham once again. And uh, I'm very grateful for Tesla as a dedicated green that they have pioneered uh, EVs. But now in phase two, every, every great automobile company, all the Mercedes and, and the BMWs and so on, and, and the VWs, are all gearing up uh, to go electric. And, we, and that, that owes a lot to Tesla. But now, in phase two, they're going to have to have some serious competition and, and to live up to the expectations of the prize uh, will be impossible. And again, even legendary investor Jeremy Grantham concurs. It is impossible for the company to live up to this expectation and this valuation. Impossible. Not going to happen. It needs 50 years for it to happen, if it happens. And the reason is, it is not the sole player. We have pretty much every manufacturer from Ford, GM, VW, the Chinese automakers, all being involved in the EV arena right now, producing products on par to Tesla products and sometimes exceeding the quality of Teslas. Take, for example, Lucid Motors. And this is yet again more absurd than Cisco in the dot-com bubble. Everybody said back then, the internet is the future and the internet will not exist without Cisco. They were right. The internet is the future, but the internet exists without Cisco. It doesn't need Cisco. Yes, the company is large. Cisco is one of the biggest and most successful companies in the world right now. But is it the same company that the gamblers and speculators back 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, imagined? Of course not. And this will also happen to Tesla. Everybody believes that Tesla is the future. EVs are the future. That's right. EVs are the future. But the part of EVs will not exist without Tesla. That's false. EVs will exist with or without Tesla. And for all you know it, Perhaps Tesla will fall behind in technology. Take a listen. It's interesting you mentioned the other auto companies because in looking at Tesla, I wonder how much of the valuation that's being put in the stock right now is really dependent upon it being almost by itself. That is to say, a very large moat around the company and how defensible that. And also the question is, what about disruption of Tesla? I think you're involved actually in a company, Quantum Scope, that in success on the battery side could actually disrupt Tesla itself. Absolutely. The new technologies come along all the time particularly in uh, solid state lithium. And um, many, many things can go wrong. 
with Tesla. I think they're a very fast-moving company, and they'll handle that kind of problem. And they'll be worth a lot of money. The question only is, has, has it discounted uh, 50 years into the future? And this is a massive problem. You cannot underestimate the power of innovation. And innovation doesn't happen in Tesla alone. It happens in Ford. It happens in GM. It happens in German auto manufacturers, certainly the Chinese auto manufacturers. And we have evolving technologies, for example, LiDAR, which Tesla refuses to use. What if LiDAR is the future? And another company scoops that technology and becomes superior to Tesla. Now, shifting to the bubble and the stock market mania, how will this bubble and this insanity end? And how does it compare with previous bubbles that we have experienced before? Once again, here's Jeremy Grantham. So, so speaking more broadly, you've said that we're in something, I think you called it an epic bubble right now. Uh, I think you've been very careful to say, I'm not going to predict when it ends. I'm just going to say that it does end. What's going to bring it to an end? The thing about the Great Bubbles 1929 Japan, no, no one knows after all these years exactly why the bubble peaked. You can say with hindsight it peaked at the point, of course, of maximum euphoria. So there was no hint of, of darkness at the end of the tunnel. Uh, everything looked absolutely splendid as the market peaked. And of course, as long as it looks absolutely splendid, everybody is happy. The, the thing about the great bubbles is how intensely do people buy into the idea that it can never break, that prices will never decline. The housing bubble of 2005, 2006 in America was a, a brilliant bubble in that description. You had people going out and buying a second house to rent because house prices never declined. Indeed, Ben Bernanke said U.S. house prices have never declined. Of course, then they promptly did but that is par for the course for the Federal Reserve. In 1929, there was a, a terrific buy-in and you could read articles in the Ladies' Home Journal saying all you had to do to get rich was to buy stocks and hold on to them. And the same thing occurred in, in 2000 in the tech bubble. And the same thing occurred in the biggest bubble of all, which was Japan in 1989, when the Japanese market went to 65 times earnings. But in US history, I would say there's a bigger buy-in this time to the idea that prices never decline and that all you have to do is buy them um, than there has ever been, which suggests that when the decline comes, it will be uh, perhaps bigger and better than anything previously in U.S. history. And here it is. You've heard it. This is the biggest bubble in U.S. history. Nothing compares at all. Not the dot-com bubble, not the housing bubble in 2007, not the 80s, not the 60s, not the nifty 50s, not even the 1920s. This is the mother of all bubbles, and the subsequent crash will be the biggest crash in history. The crash doesn't happen with an advance alert. It doesn't happen that way. Hey, folks, the market is going to crash December 19th. Please take your belongings and get the f*** out of the market. It doesn't happen that way. It almost always happens when everybody's euphoric, everything looks good, everybody's optimistic, the analysts upgrading stocks, price targets are going higher, Goldman and the likes upping their S&P 500 target, no problems at all. The liquidity on the sidelines, the trillions of dollars on the sidelines, the same garbage every single time. And then the crash happens. Why? Understand this. Every single crash in stock market history is manufactured. Yep, manufactured. It is done intentionally. How is it done? Some rich whale decides to pull the rug. We're done here. We're taking profits. I don't see the opportunity from this point on. I'd like to see a crash. I'd like to use the cash to buy the dip after that and accumulate more assets. Only one whale, that's what it takes, one whale to trigger ripple effects among the whale community and other whales start to sell and the market continues to crash and crash and crash on the top of the heads of the retail crowd the mom and pops the dummies you and i it always happens this way and what is the role of the fed in creating this mania and the subsequent disaster that is about to follow 
Here's Grantham once again. This bubble in part, if it is in bubble, as you describe it, uh, must in part be because of the amazing liquidity pumped into the, the world market, frankly, but certainly the Fed participated in that fully. We now, just the we this week, have some uh, pretty staggering numbers on consumer prices, up over 6% annualized right now in the United States. To what extent will the pricking of this bubble come if the Fed needs to respond and really step on the, on the break and maybe do it even a little abrupt abruptly? Markets peak when inflation is low and profit margins are high. It, it's not about growth. They like GDP to be very stable. They hate it bouncing around. It makes portfolio managers nervous. And our model that goes back to 1925 explains almost all the ebbing and flowing of market, bull markets and bear markets and uh, until, t until June of last year. Uh, starting in June of last year, uh, is the first time that inflation, the number one predictor since 1925, is ignored. Hmm. It, if you want to explain today's market level, yes, you have handsome profit margins. Every bull market it has a wonderful economy. Every bull market has a plentiful supply of liquidity. But every bull market before this one had low inflation. In order to explain today's market, you have to assume 100% ignoring of the rising inflation, which is quite remarkable. Yeah, We've I... never seen anything like this. We've just hit 6% today. That would have been enough in any market since 1925. And for all I know, long before that, it would have been enough to have crashed the market. But this time, the faith in the Fed is so complete that when they say it's temporary, we believe it. The Fed, in my opinion, hasn't done a thing right since Paul Volcker, who was brilliant. All of the others have encouraged a, a chain series of really dangerous uh, asset bubbles. They, they rattle the economy. They're incredibly disruptive. The decline in 2000, 82% in the NASDAQ was the decline from 2000. The decline of the housing market, all the way back to trend and below, dragging the world with it um, and all of the problems from bad mortgages and, and, and a 50% decline in the S&P. The, these have a terrible wealth effect. They make people feel poor and they make people spend less. It's the last thing you want. And yet they have not learned. They overstimulated to get to 2000. They overstimulated in the housing market. They got three or 4% more people to own houses in 2007 than had ever owned houses before. And the conse consequences were dire. And uh, have they learned? Absolutely not. So in this time, they step into uh, COVID. And of course you needed to stimulate, but did you need to throw this much money all over the world so that it flows into the stock market and creates, creates these meme stocks, this craziness that had Avis triple in one day <laughs> in, the, in the last week. And uh, why did it triple? Because in response to Tesla and Hertz and Tom Brady, et cetera, uh, Avis said, hey dudes, we're gonna buy some electric cars too. <laughs> Wham, it triples. You know, this is more extreme in scale and size um, of, of uh, market cap than anything that occurred in 1929, mm. even adjusted for the size of the economy. And here it is, you heard it. This one is bigger than 1929. Adjusting to scales, still bigger than 1929. We have never seen in human history such mass scale of speculation globally, not just in US markets. Look at the Indian market, the Korean market, the European markets, insanity across the globe. The level of greed, the level of speculation, and most importantly, arrogance have exceeded everything we've seen before in human history. And this was all possible.
due to the reckless monetary policy by the Federal Reserve and the cabal of central banks across the globe, ushering the tsunami of liquidity where money is free, floating all over the place, everybody becomes a winner in the economy. We're wondering why we have inflation? Inflation is the natural byproduct of this insanity, and it will be the nail in the coffin for this bubble. Do you really think that we're seeing right now is sustainable? Do you really think that companies' valuations will continue to be divorced from reality and fundamentals for so long? Do you really believe that everybody in the economy will become a winner, speculating on cryptos and stocks as if they were betting on horses? Do you really think that adding trillions of dollars to the public debt in a short amount of time and printing so much money in a short amount of time will come with no consequences at all? You better wake up. Moving on to macro, macro macaroni. What's going on here? In the morning, everybody was jerking off. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Why were they jerking off? Because we got retail sales. And everybody says, ah, you see the consumer is doing great. They have a lot of cash and they're spending it all over the place. All of that consumer sentiment crap that we got last week, the lowest sentiment in history, that's just garbage. We're flushed with cash, bro, and we're spending. Stop being too bearish. Okay, but there is a problem. Let's take it one step at a time. Here's the headline that we got in the morning. Retail sales rise faster than expected in October, even as inflation pushes prices higher. So what's going on here? Here's a da headline. Key reason for supply shortages, Americans keep spending. Wow, I didn't know that. I had no clue. I thought that the supply shortages are happening because trucks decided to go on a strike. But anyhow, here's the headline from, or the details I should say from the U.S. Census Bureau. This is, um, it's not a kitchen, it's more like a bar. They fix some numbers here and there once in a while. It's a little cocktail, it gets you a little drunk, a little high, but no harm done, right? And here's the headline from the Census Bureau. Retail and food services seasonally adjusted sales worth $638.2 billion in October, up 1.7% from September 2021, and up a stunning 16.3% from last year. You look at the chart, of course, 2011 all the way to 2020 before the crash, the COVID crash. Retail spending climbing higher, in a reasonable fashion, of course. And then all of a sudden we have this massive spike. What was the reason behind the spike in retail spending, by the way? The answer is the cocaine from the Federal Reserve. The liquidity, the trillions of dollars printed out of thin air. Where do you think this money will land? All over the place, but specifically for the rich. And whatever lands on the top of our heads, we take that money, we spend it buying stuff from corporations, so the money floats all the way up, and then we use the rest of the money to gamble on stocks and cryptos, and the money once again floats all the way to the top, to the 1%, the owners, the insiders. The problem is, what happens when the coke stops? I know what you're going to say, but the coke will never stop. Hold that thought. Before we do that, let's see what Americans spent their money on. All of this retail spending, where did it come from? Well, how about food and services? Uh, look at the month-over-month -month growth, not the year-over-year. -year. We already know that the year-over-year -year numbers are stunning, but we look at month-over-month. -month. A lot of spending in retail and food services, but notably electronics and appliance stores, up 3.8%. We're talking about October, folks. Not November, not December. What does that mean? A lot of people are doing Christmas shopping a lot earlier. And the reason is inflation. The longer you wait, the higher the prices will go. On top of that, we have the supply chain woes, the shortages. The longer you wait, the more likely you're going to run into shortages. And therefore, Americans are spending ahead of time. They're doing the Christmas shopping ahead of time. And this is, of course, pushing retail sales higher. We also have building materials, garden, and supplies dealers up 2.8% month over month. And this is, of course, reflected in the earnings of Home Depot, which we will cover in a second. But before we do that, we also have gasoline stations up 3.9% month over month, department stores up 2.2%. Watch out, those of you who are shorting Macy's, by the way. And then we have miscellaneous store retailers. What is that? Sex shops? They're up 2.8%. And then we have non-store retailers. These are the online Amazons and the likes. Up 4% month over month. The declines came from clothing. Who needs clothing these days? We're also witnessing declines here from health and personal care stores. Down about half a percentage point month over month. Once again, who needs health, right? If you run out of health, no big deal. You can buy another one as an NFT, of course. Problem solved. 
But here's the real problem, folks. We talked about the coke and the stimmies. We've already spent all the stimmies, so what's going on right now? Where is all of this spending coming from? The answer is savings. We're dipping into savings once again. The stimmies are gone, and US consumers dipped into savings to keep spending in September. We're also taking crypto gains, stock market gains, and we're buying stuff. What is the next resource for spending? If the stimmies are done, savings are gone, crypto gains are gone, what happens after that? The answer is stagflation. Because consumer activities will slow down after the holiday season, but prices will continue to climb higher. And you could not find a better evidence for stagflation than the Empire State Index that we got yesterday and the Import Price Index that we got today. We start with the Import Price Index. Prices are up 1.2% month over month in October, driven by wood products. There goes the transitory lumber, by the way, up 12% month over month. Petroleum and coal up 6% month over month, the fastest rate since May. And then we have food products. Stunning number, 1.8% gain month over month. But perhaps the big bomb coming from the Empire State Index, and this is the most important piece, optimism dips. These are future expectations, by the way. Right now, everything is hunky-dory. Growth remains strong. The demand remains strong. Everything's great. But when you ask participants about future expectations, that optimism, poof, gone. Here are the current indicators from the Empire State Index. New orders climbing higher. Unfilled orders diving down. Delivery times diving down. Hunky dory. Everything looks good. No problems here. The problem is perhaps prices continue to climb higher. Prices paid, prices received. But so long as growth is intact, no harm done, right? Here's the problem. The forward-looking indicators, business conditions, which is the index itself, the Empire State Index, is down 15 points month over month. Stunning. New orders down. Shipment down. Unfulfilled orders climbing higher. Delivery time climbing higher. But perhaps most importantly, prices paid and prices received also climbing higher. What does that mean? Future expectations are becoming more gloomy, with activities diving down while prices continuing to linger higher. Again, what is this phenomenon called? The answer is stagflation. So yeah, keep jerking off that the consumer is great and they have a lot of cash. No problems at all. At the hint of a disaster, not the actual disaster, just a, a, a whiff of a U-turn in this economy or the markets, by the way, and you will see the so-called great economy and great consumer falling apart so fast your head will pop out of your body. Why? Because we have an economy so dependent on stocks and the liquidity from the Fed. And if that stops and the stock market starts to collapse, the entire economy falls apart. You see, when the stock market climbs higher, the 1%, the rich, the ultra-wealthy, they get to benefit. Some of us get to benefit those of us who participate in markets. But the majority of the population doesn't benefit at all from the rise in stock prices. Some trickles here and there in jobs, benefits, bonuses, retirement accounts, etc. But when the stock market flattens and start to crash, all of us feel the pain, with exception, of course, of the 1%, because they're the one who initiated the crash by dumping and capturing their profits. If we had a bottom-up economy with small businesses, mom and pops, organic job growth in the economy, who cares about the stock market? The stock market goes up, it goes down, who cares? But when we have a top-bottom approach, a top-bottom economy, we all become at the mercy of the Fed and the stock market. Now, let's move on to earnings and see what's going on here. Before we start with the earnings that we got today, how about we go back to last week because we did not cover the earnings from last week. I will cover the most important earnings, which are DoorDash and Disney. Let's start with DoorDash, which is a name that I was shorting and I covered my short after the earnings report. The report itself is not good. If anything, it solidifies my shorting thesis. The problem is the timing is not right. For example, the revenue for DoorDash was up 45% year over year. On the other hand, costs and expenses were up 50.5% year over year, and therefore the company continues to lose money. My shorting thesis is, at some point DoorDash will run into a wall. With energy prices surging out of whack, drivers will command higher pay. With wages inflating, those drivers, those DoorDash drivers, 
will have plenty of options. And again, DoorDash will have to create more incentives, more pay for their workers, meaning their cut, their margins will be reduced. And as you can see, they're already being reduced. Costs are rising faster than revenues. But I do believe that we need perhaps another quarter before that theory is solidified. That companies like DoorDash running with no profits, they're going to run into a problem with how they pay workers, all the fees and fuel costs will eat away their margins. I would go with Uber over DoorDash if I have to because Uber is more diversified and they have plenty more options than DoorDash. Not to mention the valuation is a little better over at Uber. Next, we have Disney. What's going on here? What a disaster this one is. An absolute disappointment. There's no other words to describe this. Disappointing and disastrous. When we look at the revenues for Disney, we have two segments, of course. The streaming, media, and then we have parks. We know that year over year, the numbers for parks will be inflated. And the reason is we had the shutdowns last year. Regardless, the revenue growth for Disney Media, Disney Plus primarily, of course, were up 9% year over year. On the other hand, revenues for parks were up 99% year over year. The problem is the margins. The operating income for Disney Media, for example, were down 39% year over year. And you might say, you know what? Disney Plus is a new adventure. Of course, we're not expecting uh, returns right away. But what about parks, bro? What about the 99% increase in revenues? Hold your horses. You got to pin these numbers with 2019, not 2020, because 2020 was the outlier. We had the shutdowns. How do these numbers, the revenues for parks, about 5.4 billion, and the operating income for parks, about 640 million, how do these numbers compare with the same quarter from 2019? Here's the answer. The revenue for parks in 2019 was 6.6 billion. Meanwhile, the margins, the operating income was 1.3 billion for parks. So the stunning finding here in Disney's earnings, they have not recovered at all. And the so-called growth engine is not working either. So we have a business with two large segments, two main segments. None of them are working. Parks are now back to 2019 levels. And Disney Plus is facing a lot of hiccups. For example, the subscriber growth for Disney Plus went from 73.7 million last year to 118 million. Impressive. This is a growth of 60%. The problem is all of these are numbers on the air if you don't have the monetization, if you're not making money from your subscribers. Disney Plus revenues we're down 9% year over year. So what's going on here with this company? My analysis is, if you're going to go into an endeavor, an endeavor, as a company or as a person, by the way, you got to step with both feet in. You cannot have one feet in and the other feet out looking for other options or an insurance policy. What am I talking about here? Disney Plus or Disney as a company is producing movies and they're releasing them on Disney Plus for streaming. At the same time, they're releasing the movies for people to watch in theaters. In essence, Disney Disney is scared. It's saying, you know what? We're not really sure about this whole Disney Plus streaming. We'd like to have a foot still in the theater business. All of the Marvel crap, the DC Comics crap, making hundreds of billions in the box office. Why let go of that and place all of your eggs in one basket in Disney Plus? This is the problem with Disney. You gotta step with both feet in. You gotta release the Marvel crap the DC comic crap, the popular movies that make hundreds of millions of dollars in the box office. You gotta release them exclusively on Disney Plus and you gotta charge 25, 30 bucks a pop. No popcorn included either. And guess what? The zombies are gonna pay. And the revenues for Disney Plus will skyrocket. But this approach of one foot here and the other there, that's not gonna work. You hear that, Mickey Mouse? Now, what about the earnings that we got this week so far? We got Tyson, and today we got Home Depot and Walmart. Let's start with Tyson. And folks, remember this. We're looking for companies with the pricing power and the receptive consumer because this dynamic of pricing power and a receptive consumer is what companies need to withstand this inflation storm. If you're not exercising your pricing power or your consumer is not receptive to the increase in prices, you're not an inflationary company. You're not an inflation hedge kind of stock. So let's see if these companies have the pricing power, whether they're exercising the pricing power, and what about the consumer? Are they receptive or not? Starting with Tyson. The sales for Tyson were up 12% year over year. The operating income was a stunning 98% increase year over year. And all in all, the bottom line, the net income, was up a stunning, a mind-blowing 
207% year over year. So why did Tyson experience all of these great results in the last quarter? The answer is pricing power. For example, the volume of sales for beef, pork, and chicken were all down year over year, but the average prices were significantly higher and therefore the revenue, the sales for Tyson shot up higher. For example, beef prices were up 32.7% year over year. For pork, prices were up 38% year over year. For chicken, prices were up 18.7% year over year. Once again, transitory. Huh, Mr. Pound? When we look at the operating margins for Tyson, Beef is the best producing segment with almost 23% growth year over year. And then we have pork 4.7% and chicken were down 3.5% year over year. Here's what Tyson needs to do. They need to continue to jack up prices higher for beef and pork, but specifically pork, to compensate for the weakness in chicken because chicken prices did not go higher. You can still have nuggets for now. Who knows how long would that last? But for now, the inflation is happening in beef and pork prices primarily, and therefore Tyson has to jack up prices even higher. Exploit the opportunity while you still have it. Next, we have Home Depot. And everybody was excited in the morning about Home Depot's earnings. I was not not, I thought they were okay, but not so impressive. For example, the revenue growth year over year was 9.8%. The cost of sales expenses were up 9.9%. Yet perhaps the source of excitement was the significant rise in the bottom line in net earnings. They were up 20.3% year over year. What was the secret for Home Depot? Perhaps they're not experiencing labor inflation meaning wages. Their expenses went up by only 1.5% year over year. What does that mean? Home Depot is not facing the labor shortage or the wage inflation that other companies are facing. Matter of fact, if you walk to Home Depot right now, good luck asking for help because there are nobody working there. This is how Home Depot managed to cheat the system and beat this inflation. If wages are climbing higher, stop hiring people. Just place a bunch of uh, checkout, self-checkout stations, and maybe four people working the store. And then after hours, when nobody's watching, you can hire the Mexicans waiting outside for five bucks a piece to clean the store and do everything. Problem solved, done. But don't expect the same results, by the way, from Lowe's tomorrow, because Lowe's has some customer service. Anyhow, moving to Walmart, what's going on here? Not so good. Revenues are up 4.3% year over year. The cost of sales up 4.7% year over year. And then the other expenses are up 3.9% year over year. All in all, the net income, the bottom line, is down 39.5% year over year. So what's going on here? Two things. Number one, Walmart, just like Amazon, struggling to match numbers from last year. Last year was the outlier. We shut down everything and everybody had to shop at Walmart, Target, Amazon, the big giant stores. And now all of a sudden these companies are struggling to match numbers from last year. This was expected, of course. What was not expected is the fact that Walmart did not exercise their pricing power. Walmart has this strategy that everybody raise their prices higher and we're going to continue to use our leverage and our power to keep prices down. We're going to steal away all of these consumers. They're going to shop at Walmart. Yes, our prices will be lower. Our margins will be down. But the volume of sales will make up for all of that. This is, of course, a crap strategy. And the royal family, the Waltons, already dumped their stocks. So who cares now? Not touching the stock, even though it is cheap right now, but not touching it until and unless Walmart makes a commitment and becomes more serious about raising prices and exercising their pricing power. The zombified consumer still has some stimmies and they're dipping into their savings. Exploit the opportunity while you still have it. Anyhow, folks, we're moving on to the market's coverage, starting with the performance of the market today and here we go the Dow industrial average closing in the green by 54.77 points or a gain of 0.15 percent the Nasdaq leading the pack closing in the green by 120 points or a gain of 0.76 percent the S&P 500 also closing in the green by 18.10 points or a gain of 0 0.39 percent what about the sector's performance today awful the market was led pretty much by two sectors number one consumer cyclicals capturing the gold of course what was the reason behind the rise of consumer cyclicals today number one home depot and lows number two the rise in auto 
automotive manufacturers, specifically EV, Lucid, Tesla, etc. And then at number two, we had technology, technology also popping higher and capturing silver, of course. We're not going to give any bronze medal here because the performances are pathetic, but the laggards of the day were led by materials, utilities, and REITs. What about the advanced to decline ratios? NYSE 42% advancing versus 55% declining. The NASDAQ 42% advancing versus 55% declining. We have the mirror image between the NYSE and the NASDAQ. The breadth remains awful, but the indices continues to climb higher. Moving on to futures, what's going on here? Crude oil prices taking a break. The WTI was moderately in the red. And then we have Brent climbing by about half a percentage point today. We got the news from the Saudis and the Russians that the market is actually oversupplied right now, and it will be oversupplied all the way till next year. Does it even matter? Of course not, because oil prices are not rising due to the supply and demand dynamics. Maybe 10 to 20% of the rise is due to the supply and demand dynamics, but the main reason for the climb in oil prices is due to speculation. And speculation is rampant across the market right now, not just in commodities, but even stocks. We also see in gasoline, heating oil and natural gas prices climbing higher today what about softs we have gains for lumber we got the results from home depot and the retail sales import prices all indicating that lumber prices are climbing higher again remember this is the transitory lumber right lumber climbing higher oj climbing higher cocoa coffee sugar cotton all climbing higher an excellent day overall for softs what about metals what's going on here the dollar is surging higher this is not good for metals we're now reading 96 on the dollar the question is at what point does the market panic 96 97 98 we know that metals are not going to like the rise in the dollar taperings happen dollar goes higher and therefore gold is down silver is down Platinum down, copper down. The only exception is palladium closing on the flat line. What about meats? Live cattle not doing anything at all. Feeder cattle gains a little over half a percentage point, And then we have lean hogs futures climbing higher and gaining about 2.5% today. What about grains? We have losses across the board, with exception of oats. Oats continue to climb higher. Stunning rally so far. And then we have soybean oil also climbing higher today. Canola, rough rice, pretty much on the flat line, but we have losses led by wheat, corn, soybean meal, and soybeans futures. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The hottest table by far is Microsoft with about 1 million contracts exchanging hands today. About 91% of those were calls. And the reason is we have dividends tomorrow for Microsoft. And this is usually, not always, but usually, is an indicator that the stock will trade down tomorrow. Therefore, we have a lot of holders selling covered calls. And we have a lot of holders who are going to cash the dividend and then dump the stock. At number two, we have Apple with about 1 million contracts. About 76% of those were calls. At number three, Lucid Motors with about 1 million contracts again. About 66.5% of those were calls. Watch out for Chevron too because we have about 700,000 contracts traded for the name today. About 97% of those were calls. The good news is... Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, is adding to Chevron. But we also have dividends, and that will happen tomorrow, and therefore they're selling upside calls. Now, let's see if they hold after the dividend payment, or are they going to dump right away? Because we have a segment of investors buying Chevron primarily for the dividend. Moving on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today, starting with the ticker HTZ. This is for Hertz. You guessed it. They're buying calls, they're buying puts, they're all over the place, and the implied volatility is surging higher. For this trade, they bought the 25 calls for the expiration date December 17th with expectations that Hertz could climb higher by more than 8% by then. They paid about one buck and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about six million dollars. And then we have the ticker LCID Lucid. Watch out with this one. You could get burned right away. The stock moves double digits up or down pretty much every single day. If you are on the wrong side, you're gonna get smoked. 
We're seeing a squeeze right now on mania and EVs in general, but somebody's calling a top here by buying puts. They're buying the 50 bucks puts for the expiration date this upcoming Friday, November 19th, with expectations that the name could dive down by more than 10% by then. They paid all about one buck a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $3 million. What about the trade for the ticker KWEB, K W E B, the Chinese ETF for technology? They're buying calls here, the 56 calls for the expiration date day December 3rd with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 8% by then. They paid about 70 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $1.2 million. And here it is, the ticker M for Macy's. It is reporting earnings this week and options traders are making bets already. The name is up about 600% bottom to top for now. You have a lot of bears buying puts that Macy's will crash. Be careful here because as retail sales showed, the spending on department stores is climbing higher number one number two we have whales like david tepper for example buying macy's and remember the example of avis lots of shorting ahead of the print and when the print comes out better than expectations we see massive squeezes and massive short covering but anyhow they're buying calls in this case the 35 calls for the expiration date november 26 with expectations the name could pop higher by more than eight and a half percent by then they paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about one million dollars what about the trades for the ticker lazr this is for luminar a company that i cover in this channel a lot and i just traded the name a few days ago bought the stock it popped right away about 60 percent in a single day i closed that trade right away then the name report reported earnings and went down but here we have somebody buying calls and we have others buying puts of course Perhaps it is the same trader with a different strategy, but we're going to cover the calls here, the significant one of course, buying the 24 calls for the expiration date December 3rd, with the expectations that LAZR could pop higher by more than 15% by then. They paid about 50 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $400,000. Lastly at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker DHI for DR Horton? They're buying calls, the 105 calls for the expiration date January 24th first with the expectations that the name could pop higher by more than six percent by then they paid about two bucks and 75 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about two million dollars and before we move on i want to revisit a trade from yesterday because we did not do a coverage for the options market in last night's video but this was significant the trade for tesla tsla they bought calls the 1100 calls for the expiration date december 23rd they paid about over 30 million dollars for these calls and again you see these trades 30 million you see somebody pumping qualcomm today by buying calls out of the money significant amounts and he asked the question is it really retail behind this mania i don't believe it there are tremendous efforts here from large players powerful players to manipulate the market via options and where is the sec you might ask the answer is in a coma moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here the majority of the action is led via options you track the options market and you know what's going on. They're buying calls on Qualcomm. Qualcomm is up over 7% today. Out of the money, of course. Significant quantities. They're not opening interest at all. They're trading them in and out within the same day. And we have AMD, similar story, up over 4%. The options activities are also elevated for software names, the likes of Snowflake, Trade Disk, Shopify, all rising higher today. And needless to say, of course, the EV mania, Tesla rising higher, Lucid rising higher, Revion rising higher, the Chinese names also rising higher. But the rest of the market remains pretty much muted, no activities, crickets, notable weakness in banks. Even though yields are popping higher, notable weakness in industrials, in materials, utilities, REITs, even defensives are down. Of course, we have travel stocks, airlines, and cruises also down because we have Norwegian cruises, for example, dumping more shares. And we have a confirmation that these companies are not out of the woods, not even close. And therefore, I remain bearish on airlines. Likewise, we have notable activities in ATVI, Activision Blizzard, aka the Frat House. And we now know 
if the source of the news is correct, that the CEO was well aware of these violations and toxic culture within the company, and he did not do anything at all. And therefore, the stock is crashing again today. The stock will not recover until this man is removed and the entire management is reformed in that company. Moving on to charts. What's going on here? Starting with SPY 30 minutes chart. We have a new support at 462. It was confirmed twice now on the way up and on the way down. The chart continues to make higher highs and it is consolidating pretty much at all time highs. Is there any problem here in the chart of the SPY? Not from a 30 minutes perspective at all. What about the daily chart? Can we see anything different here? The risk remains. We have elevated momentum indicators ready to reverse. Look at the MACD, look at the RSI all ready to pull down. We also have the potential for double top formation. If it happens, it will be ominous and it could take the SPY all the way down. This is the futures chart, of course, the daily chart. It could take us down all the way to 4,549.5, the previous support. The answer whether we're going to have a double top or not will happen as soon as tomorrow. All what the SPY needs to do is another pop higher and the scenario of the double top goes out of the window. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart, what's going on here? We went down to the support zone, code the support, and now the chart is making higher lows. So long as it makes higher lows, the chart remains intact. But you gotta watch out for what? The 10-year yield chart. If it continues to pop higher, 1.7, 1.75, 1.8, 1 this chart of the Qs will not hold regardless of the options market speculation. For now, we have to identify a support slash resistance level at around 397. And the chart is showing a bull flag formation for now. Will it play out? Will it not play out? The answer for that could come out from the daily chart of the continuous contract. Speaking of, here it is, the daily chart with the continuous contract on the NASDAQ. Again, the momentum indicators highly extended, begging to pull back. We have the potential for a double top again, as we've seen with the SPY. But we could have another bearish formation of a reverse ABC pattern. All of that could go out of the window starting tomorrow, perhaps overnight, if the Qs, the future chart of the Qs, pop higher. Another leg higher, all-time highs, then the reverse ABC goes out of the window. Moving on to the IWM 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We have a new support at 237 and a half. The chart went down twice and it failed to resume the rally higher after reaching the support twice. What does that mean? In all likelihood, the IWM will have to go down all the way to 233 before finding the energy and the fuel enough to resume the rally. Moving on to the dollar index, Dixie, what's going on here? Surging higher and now reaching the resistance of 96. Is it going to stop here? Maybe, but if tapering is going on, and we are expecting a more aggr aggressive taper, by the way, then the dollar will continue to surge higher. And the next resistance, by the way, could be 97, if not 98. And therefore, the so-called inflation trade is not going to like it. When the dollar reaches over 96, 97, we're going to start to see some nervousness here in the commodities market. And therefore, I'm thinking about, haven't made a decision yet, thinking about dumping my positions in these commodities-related, inflation-related names, meaning Freeport, McMoran, Copper, Alcoa, Aluminum, even the steel stocks that I own, because if the dollar continues to move higher, we're going to have a problem here. You can tolerate the rise of the dollar for a little while, but if it becomes evident that inflation is not going to push the dollar down as we've seen in the 1970s, because right now we have tapering, we did not have tapering back in the 70s, we will perhaps have a rotation from the commodities related stocks, aka inflation stocks, to another sector of the market. What would that be? Who knows? You cannot say tech while yields are surging higher. Moving on to gold, what's going on here? We had a little bit of FOMO here, pushing gold higher, but I told you it could be a trap. And the reason is you cannot ignore the rise in the dollar and yields together. Two enemies of gold. Let's see if gold backs up all the way to the three amigos, the support, it was resistance, now support. If it bounces higher, then he got my attention. But if it fails, then what is the point here? Moving on to the chart of the 10-year yield, what's going on here? We had the head and shoulder. The chart went down, forming a reverse head and shoulder. And now it is popping higher, reversing the negative divergence on the RSI and the negative divergence on the MACD indicator. What does that mean? Yields on the trajectory of pushing their way higher. Is this stock market positive? Of course not. What is the level that's going to start shaking the market again? The answer is 1.7. Going over 1.7, we're going to have a massive problem here. 
Now, why aren't banks responding to the rise in yields? Be careful of your assumptions here, because the KRE, regional banks, which are more sensitive to yields, by the way, than the large ones, JP Morgan, Bank of America, regional banks are trading at all-time highs. And so is the XLF, by the way. So you might say yields are popping higher today, but the financial sector is underperforming. Interesting divergence. We'll see if it continues. What about the TLT weekly chart? What's going on here? We have the second failure right now of trading above 149. The chart consolidated for weeks and it failed to push its way above 149. It went down, gathering some energy, tried again, and it failed. This is an ominous signal that the TLT will go down to 134.5 and, and yields on the 10 year will reach at least a minimum. 1.7. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. What's going on here? Holding above 15. The MACD indicator is your leading indicator, by the way. If we have a crossing on the four hours, creating green impressions of the histogram, then you know the VIX will pop higher, the SPY will trade down. If we see the pop happening as soon as tomorrow, for example, the VIX, and then the SPY pulling back, then we're going to have the double top formation on the SPY. Exciting. What about a daily chart for Apple? What's going on here? The bear flag played out, but Apple caught support wide away, and now it is hugging the resistance slash support of 150. Could it climb higher? Yes, it could, but it needs a little bit of action here in the options market. Options market participants are, let's say, a little distracted by the EV mania. Speaking of, here is a chart for the Souffle Tesla, a daily chart. The chart went down. Elon Musk continues to dump. He's not finished dumping. He's threatening now, threatening to dump more. He said to Bernie Sanders, don't you dare push me to make more money. Do you want me to make more money? Do you want me to dump more? And of course, all of this is garbage. He was going to dump either way. He did not need a poll. He did not need to fight with Bernie Sanders. We know he has to sell a minimum of $22 billion. This is related to options, of course. And there are other theories. You might have heard the big short, Michael Burry, saying that Elon Musk has to cover his ass because he took an enormous amount of loans. Who cares? But Elon continues to dump right now. The chart rebounded because we still have some excitement here from options market participants and the likes. Buying the dip in Tesla, believing that this is an opportunity to buy, even though the CEO is dumping, by the way. So the chart went all the way up with an attempt to close the gap. The gap is 1,063.5. It did not happen. The chart closed at 1,000. 57. Perhaps we ran out of time. We'll see what happens tomorrow. If the chart trades up, closing the gap, then so far so good. Perhaps we have a tradable bottom here. But if the chart reverses before closing the gap, this is an ominous signal that we have lower lows to come. And target number one will be 900. Target number two will be the trend line. Tulips, what's going on here? BTC pulling back. We had the bear flag at the resistance at around 64,000. 899 and the bear flag is playing out we have negative divergences on the hour side macd indicators what does that mean perhaps you want to wait till 55,300 before you pull the trigger and buy the dip anyways this is my advice you can ignore it you can go with the anthony scumbagamushi who says that cryptos and bitcoin is going to the moon and it's better than gold anyhow moving on to amc what's going on here we had the reverse head and shoulder formation. The chart moves higher, beating the resistance of 42.5. The next destination becomes the gap. Where is the gap? The gap around 44.5. Did it close the gap? It did not. It reversed before closing the gap, and this is always, always an ominous signal that the chart doesn't have what it takes to move higher. And lastly, here is a bonus chart for all of you maniacs and uh, tickers addicts. The ticker is GoEV, G-O-E-V for who cares, Canoe, another EV mania. The stock is showing a saucer bottom and I tweeted about this today. I'm seeing a lot of options activities in this name. If Lucid and Revion can go crazy, why can't Canoe? On top of the saucer bottoming, we also have a reverse in the trend. We had a sloping resistance line that has been going on since the beginning of the year. The trend has shifted with the saucer bottom. Now we have a positive trend. The stock is popping higher because there is some news. The company is relocate, relocating its headquarters to Oklahoma or Arkansas. Who cares? Who cares? We care about the ticker and we want the ticker to go higher, right? And therefore, I bought the stock. Not the options. I bought the stock and the strategy is I'm going to sell upside calls. My exit target is 12. If the stock goes there, I will make about 20% gains. And on top of that, I'm going to sell some calls 
So all in all, depending on the implied volatility, I could make 30 to 40% fast. Now, if it doesn't happen, this is a wild shot kind of trade. I'm not betting my house on it. And of course, when we look at the options activities, they bought a lot of the 10 bucks calls and the 12 and a half calls. Not only traded them, by the way, but they're holding. We have open interest, unlike Qualcomm, unlike AMD, unlike Tesla, unlike NVIDIA. They're actually holding the stock. And here's a little bit of fundamentals for you. The company has about 600 to 700 million dollars in cash. The company's valuation right now is around 2 billion dollars. If you're just going to use a cash flow discount model, it's not absurdly expensive. I mean, look at Revion, for example. They have about $2.5 billion in cash. The company's trading above the valuations of VW. So again, why can't Canoe also pop higher and go crazy? Let's go crazy. Let's go Brandon. Anyhow, we're moving on to the conclusion of this video before it gets any crazier than this. What do we have on the earnings calendar tomorrow? We have Lowe's, TG Maxx, Target, NVIDIA, and Cisco. What do we have on the economic calendar? Nothing. We have some housing data from building permits and housing starts. This will be important, of course. And then we have uh, some Fed zombies speaking. Who cares? They're speaking about racism and climate change and stable coins. They out of touch, out of mind. Nobody's speaking about inflation. How about we have some Fed presidents speaking about inflation? You know their job. Anyhow, folks, we're done here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. This is all I got for you for now. But I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.